We've gone over the prospects to know for the Orlando Magic at number six. It's time to introduce you to a few prospects to keep an eye out for with the Magic's pick at number 11. I promise not to stick my foot in my mouth this time around. It's time for Locked On Magic. You are Locked On Magic, your daily Orlando Magic podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. are indeed locked on magic today is may 23rd 2023 my name is philip rossman i'm the expert insight editor over at orlando magic daily.com just follow me on twitter at philip rr underscore omd on today's episode of locked on magic we're going to talk about prospects to know the five prospects to know for the orlando magic at the number 11 pick we're going to go into a few of we're going to go into a few of them certainly in more detail as we get closer and closer to the draft but this is designed to introduce you to the prospects that I think you should be at least generally aware of as we begin to prepare for the NBA draft. Before we do that, though, we want to thank you again for making Locked On Magic part of your day every day. No matter when you listen to us, whether it's first thing in the morning, whether it's right when we upload, we truly appreciate you making Locked On Magic part of your day every day. Remember, there's a great Locked On podcast covering every single team in the NBA. Just search for Locked On and the team you're looking for, the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Today's podcast is also brought to you by the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA. For $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. I want to preface uh, what we're going to talk about today uh, with, with an acknowledgement that this list is inherently limiting. Just plain and simple, the deeper you get into the draft, the more options you have. The more players you have to pick from, the closer a lot of these players are. The the groups, the tiers get bigger. And so I I want to preface this that I'm pointing out five players. And there are probably five players I'm going to focus on a little bit more and five players that I have my eye on. Um, But this this list is very limiting. Uh, And so what I want to do with this is just give you an idea of what the level of talent is, what the issues might be, and who the Magic might be looking at at number 11. I think it's important to note, too, that who the Magic take at number 6 is going to have a major play on what happens at number 11. We recently did the Locked On mock draft. I will reserve those results for when we come out with the mock draft in a couple weeks. I will also preface, and please remember this, who I would pick today is very different than who I would pick next week, who I would pick tomorrow, who I would pick down the road. That's okay. This is the time of year to make those changes. But... One thing I discovered and one one of the strategies that I had in, in our mock draft is who I took at number six would determine who I take at 11. What I do with 11 would determine who I take at six. And so it's important to, to just remember how much the tree branch grows uh, the deeper you get into the draft. But I, I will say this. I am very much targeting very much thinking about, very much focused on one player at number 11. And I'm not going to deny it. I'm probably going to do a deeper dive and tell you a little bit more about him uh, later on this week. Um, you know, I, I, we've done a couple draft profiles at OrlandoMagicDaily.com. We'll be doing a lot more as we get closer to the draft. But I, I think that the Magic's guy at 11, if the Magic keep 11, and, and honestly, if the Magic do decide to go in a different direction with six, take a Taylor Hendricks, or, or, or fill another need at six, I think it's because they feel pretty confident that that this guy will be at 11. And, and that is Jordan Hawkins. Between him and Grady Dick, if the Magic come away with one of those two players on draft night, that will be a very good draft to me. Like, I, like I've said a million times, my goal on draft night this year is I want the Magic to come away with the shooter. At the end of the day, all that matters to me is June 23rd, Friday, June 23rd, the Magic have a shooter in tow. The Magic have a shooter that will be part of their team. And the more I watch Jordan Hawkins, the more I like what I see, and the more I think he could be that shooter. He could be that guy that gives the Magic that boost. Hawkins 
uh, went to UConn, won a national championship, was a key part of that national championship team, had a great NCAA tournament, averaged 16.2 points per game, um, was a volume three-point shooter with 109 three-point makes, made 38.8% of his three-pointers on 7.6 attempts per game. You watch his tape, and this isn't just a guy taking pull-up threes, certainly can, takes taking sidestep threes, certainly can, an occasional step back three, sure. This guy shoots threes in the way that NBA players shoot threes. He is not, he can hit the stand still threes. He was, I think he shot like 48, 49% on catch and shoot threes. Um, he can shoot catch and, th- he can make catch and shoot threes. But you watch him play and he's coming off screens. He's coming off pin downs. He's coming, he's doing relocations. He can shoot on the move. And, and that is a skill that is very tough to find. Look, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Hawkins is the answer and, and, and is someone that can be above that. Um, he's got a really nice shooting stroke. He can get it off in traffic. You know, he he can hit he can hit shots quickly and hit a bunch of shots. The rest of his game definitely needs a lot of work. His defensive consistency maybe isn't all the way there. Um, he, he's not much of a driver, not much of a finisher through contact. If he's got a straight line drive and, and a clear and a path to the basket, he's going to score. But working around players, through players, is, is tricky. If you're drafting Jordan Hawkins, you're playing the upside on his defense and, and on his potential to fill in the rest of his game. But you're drafting him for a shooting. I would say Grady Dick is probably ahead of him as far as form goes. I would say Grady Dick is ahead of him as far as defensive understanding and awareness goes. I think the other parts of Grady Dick's game fill in better right now but I think Hawkins has the potential to be the better player. And honestly, I think Hawkins has the potential to be the better shooter. Maybe we're picking nits here, but Hawkins was a better free throw shooter than Grady Dick. Hawkins can get to the line better than Dick probably can. And so I think there has to be some real consideration that, yeah, Grady Dick is a really good player, but he may also be somewhat limiting. Whereas Hawkins, sure, he is what he is now, but he also could become a little bit more. And not only that, He'll be available at 11, where there aren't many other great options available. We're going to talk about some of those other players here in a minute, but you look at the Magic's needs, and and this is where the gaming of the draft should come into play for Orlando. And I think they do have to think this way. You take talent, you take the best player on your board, you don't worry so much about this stuff, but you do have to kind of think this way. The Magic need a backup forward. They need some forward depth. They need depth in general, but they need a four. They need a backup forward. They need some forward depth. They need shooting. If you can get that shooter at 11, your backup forward players at 11 are not that great. We're going to talk about a few more players here in a minute. They're all guards. The guys that I am interested in that, you know, at least are being mocked at 11, that, that I would rate uh, at this at, at around this area, they're all guards. And so if you're looking, you know, Jeff Weldman has said this before, you take what the draft gives you. You, know, you can only take what the draft gives you. If you want a backup center and the draft didn't give you a backup center, you can't do much about it. Now, this, center, this draft does have one backup center that's worth mentioning, and that's Derek Lively of Duke. Really defensive-minded center. Um, not much in the way of offense. Really inconsistent season at Duke, but he also had to play a lot of four playing alongside Kyle Filipowski. Um, really up and down season for him, but one of the top high school recruits was, was considered a lottery pick. Before the season it is not a lottery pick. Is not you know he could be a lottery pick, but not widely considered a lottery pick anymore. That's about the only center option out outside of Victor Wembanyama. And, and again, personally for me, I want a veteran center. I, I don't think the Magic should go with a rookie center behind Wendell Carter. I, I think they I think they need a veteran guy uh, in that spot. So to me. Honestly, if the Magic are keeping both picks, and maybe that is a faulty assumption, if the Magic are keeping both picks, to me, Hawkins at 11 feels really comfortable. And maybe I'm just overhyping the kid. I don't know if I'm overhyping the kid, but maybe I'm too on this kid. I know people who don't like him. Uh, Locked on Pelicans, I think, is doing an episode on Jordan Hawkins today. You can hear their take. I know they aren't huge fans of Hawkins. I see it. I see it for this Magic team. I see it fitting. I see it working. I see it being something that this team needs, and I see him really establishing himself in this ecosystem. But that's part of what the draft is, is 
figuring out how all these pieces fit together. We're going to talk about some of the other prospects to watch at number 11. We'll get to that coming up here in just a moment. But first, it's time for a quick word from our friends over at Game Time. I'm getting ready. I've got my Memorial Day weekend. I get an extra day off for Memorial Day. I know I'm excited about it. I know you're probably excited about it. And guess what? The Tampa Bay Rays are home all week. So I am doing something I have not done in two decades. I'm not kidding. I have not been to a Tampa Bay Rays game, I'm pretty sure, in more than two decades. I'm really excited to see the Major League Baseball's best team. And you know where I went to get my tickets to one of the marquee games on the schedule this Friday against the Los Angeles Dodgers. I went to game time. I looked at the prices, I compared them to the official website, and I found the game time prices to, if if not be comparable, be better every time. And buying on game time was so much easier than I expected. You just simply click the section that you want. They have they have the map of the stadium, they have the prices like in little bubbles atop the seats. You pick the section, you pick the price that you want, and you are in the game. Buying tickets has never been easy or less stressful. Then with Game Time, it's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. You can get images of your seat before you buy, it so you know exactly what to expect. It even like moves around, like you know, you, you take your phone, you move it around. It, it 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 does that thing where it kind of shows you the full, not 360, but a good chunk of what you're going to actually see. You can buy tickets in a matter of seconds. It's really two taps, and you're set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone. You never have to dig through your email. They really do. They send it to you in a text. That's awesome. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Okay, let's talk. You know, again, I'm pretty centered on on Jordan Hawkins. At 11. I'm not going to lie about that. That's that's my pick. That's the guy that I want the Magic to take at 11. But we do got to talk about some other guys. And again, so much of what we talk about is going to be about shooting. Um, you know, if you're a guard trying to be on the Magic right now, you better be able to shoot. Because between Jalen Suggs and Markel Fultz, we're covered with guards with spotty shooting records. Again, I think they're better shooters than their numbers show. Um, but that's neither here nor there. And so we do have to talk about Keontae George. At one point in the season, very early in the season actually, Keontae George was kind of was mocked to be the Magic's pick at six, uh, to be their to be their own draft pick. And for whatever reason, George just kind of tailed off this season. He at times struggled in big games and marquee games, and he really struggled in the NCAA tournament. You know, again when the chips are down. You know, you look at. A Jordan Hawkins, he had a 20-point game against Arkansas. We'll get to the Arkansas duo here in a sec. Um, but Keontae George didn't step up in the big moments, and that gave everyone a little bit of pause. His numbers are okay. though. 15.3 points per game, shooting splits of 37.6, 33.8, 79.3. In two NCAA tournament games, just 16 points on three for 19 shooting. Some of this is about role, though. Keontae George, if you watch him, Great shot, got distance on it, decent free throw shooter, so it seems like it'll translate. This is a guy that can shoot and can hit big shots. Role matters here, and this is where I think Keontae George is going to be able to uh, to, to make some moves a little bit into, into this draft and get some serious consideration for 11. Because he's a big dude, he can guard, he can guard a little bit, but his role at Baylor, he was the main creator. He was the main guy, he was the main shot taker. And the truth of the matter is, it became very clear, very clear quickly, that while that's what Baylor needed him to do to succeed and have any chance chance at winning, that's not what he's going to do in the NBA. That's not what he's good at. He was inefficient, and like Cam Whitmore, you know, who we talked a little bit about on Friday, we'll talk a little bit more about later on later on in the week, most likely. Um, certainly, we're going to talk about him on Thursday's episode. That's a tease. Definitely tune in for Thursday's episode. Um, if, you know, if everything goes to plan. Uh, but Keontae George just, he isn't the main guy. And so a lot of his numbers and a lot of the way that he played in college doesn't fit. 
Didn't have a lot of catch and shoot opportunities because the ball was in his hands. That's not who he's going to be in the NBA. And so again, this is where the draft becomes really tricky. Is you got to try and project. Okay, what's he going to do when he doesn't have the ball in his hands? Now, to that point, this is why Keontae George is still, I think, attractive. Because he can attack off the dribble. He does have that skill. He may not be great at it, but facing a rotating defense, coming off the bench, against the third best defender, the fourth best defender on the other team, that's a good skill to have. Going up against a closeout, being able to go to the basket, finish, is a big skill to have. That, that's what kind of elevates, that's certainly what elevates you a little bit as a role player. And so George, to me, is still a very viable option at 11. One of the better options because he is a good shooter. You watch him shoot the ball, even off the dribble, it looks good. He gets good balance. He's able to hit though, he's able to hit shots. I and mean, when he does get standstill shots, when he when he, you know he can pull up from deep deep, those are shots that he is certainly capable of taking. Uh, and, a, and, and a player who can make a big impact. I, I still, I, I, I'm a little lower on Keontae George, obviously, than I was back in January. But this is a guy that can still play a little bit. And, and this is certainly a guy that fits some of the needs the Magic have. I think one of the bigger risers that we're going to see uh, over the next few weeks, um, it shouldn't be that much of a surprise because Kentucky players always seem to outperform their college stats and, and certainly seem to work out well and, and make good impressions. John Calipari, say what you want about him as a college coach. Um, you know the way that he runs his program. Certainly, Kentucky is starting to have fallen off in terms of competitiveness year year in and year out. And now that everyone has really embraced the one and done rule and NIL is kind of uh, even the level the playing field a little bit. John Calipari prepares his players for the NBA, except for maybe Daniel Orton. No one is a bigger cheerleader. No one is a bigger place player place for, for the NBA. John Calipari gets his guys ready to play. It shouldn't be a coincidence. It should be a trend that everyone is aware of. You know, not a determinative thing, but certainly something they should be aware of. That Jamal Murray was drafted in the teens. Devin Booker was drafted in the teens. Or, or 11 or 12 or something like that. Um, and uh, Tyrese Maxey was drafted in the 20s. All three of those guards are really good, <laughs> to say the least. It's just plain and simple. They're all really good. And so I think you do have to look at that Kentucky jersey and that Kentucky brand and say, okay, what does that mean for the future? You know, can we trust Kentucky players? We know that or- Orlando loves their Michigan men. Between Mo Wagner, Franz Wagner, Caleb Houston, Orlando loves Michigan players. They come with a pedigree. They come with an understanding of how to play that certainly translates. They're coached a certain way. And so we have to wonder about that with Cason Wallace. Cason Wallace was a point guard for Kentucky, uh, averaged 11.7 points per game, shooting splits of 44.6, 34.6, 75.7. Not the best finisher in the world at the basket from what I've seen, but Cason Wallace is a an elite defender at the college level. He was a fantastic defender, just gets into players, great size, um, just does everything that you could ask for. Um, 4.3 assists per game, able to get in the paint, able to get to the basket. Again, I'm not sold on his finishing. I'm personally not really sold on Cason Wallace, but, you know, again, I wasn't sold on Tyrese Maxey because of his inefficiency either. I, I want to put this for reference. Tyrese Maxey in his final year at Kentucky, in his, in his lone year at Kentucky, averaged 14 points per game on shooting splits of 42-7, 29-2, 83-3. The 29.23 point shooting percentage, I am sure, and you can go back into our archives to when he was drafted, I'm sure I mentioned that 29.2% three-point shooting. That had me out on him because the Magic so desperately needed shooting. But like I always say, free throw shooting is a better indicator that 83.3 free throw percentage certainly seems to have won the day as Maxi is a fairly reliable three-point shooter now. Case and Wallace at 75.7, that's not bad, but it's not like elite level. So, um... You know, again, I think I think Wallace, I think Wallace is really talented. You know, he's not like super blinding fast, but he's athletic. He's smart. He lives in the paint. He understands how to get in the paint. Maybe the playmaking can improve. The shooting's going to be what determines whether he makes it or not, whether he's able to succeed in this league or not. And again, that's still such a huge question. Again, that's that's a big thing, but there's certainly indicators that suggest that he could. And again. I think you do have to trust Kentucky players, especially these Kentucky guards a little bit, that, you know, they 
may not look great statistically. And again, Jamal Murray was a better sh- shot maker. Uh, you know, Devin Booker was clearly a shot maker, even though he didn't do a lot. Those Kentucky teams that Murray, Maxey, and Booker were on were significantly more talented and loaned with NBA players. They had to spread the wealth. I'm not sure that's the case with Wallace. So you have to understand, again, context matters when you're looking at college stats and understanding, okay, what did this guy have to do? You know, why is Kante George's shooting percentage is low? Well, he was on the ball a lot. Why were Cam Whitmore's shooting percentage low? He was on the ball a lot. Is that why his three-point percentage was low? Probably. But with Whitmore, I, I mentioned his free throw shooting being a little bit of a concern. Wallace, I have that same concern, but it, it's not nearly to, to, to the same degree. So, it, it's hard. <laughs> Drafting is hard. When we come back, we're going to talk about a pair of players from Arkansas that profile very similarly, so we'll do them in one bucket, plus one more player uh, to help us kind of close out who we're looking at with the number 11 pick. We'll get to that coming up here in just a moment. But first, it's time for a quick word from our friends over at Price Picks. The conference finals are nearing an end. It's kind of sad. We're not going to have, we, you know, the NBA finals start June 1st, whether we want them to or not. Um, so we might be out of basketball for a little while. We might be in a basketball sabbatical for a little while. But the Superflex promotion continues over at Price Picks. Every day of the NBA playoffs and finals, one Price Picks user is going to get a chance to become a millionaire. One entry placed after 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time will be randomly selected each day. And our place that entry will be given a six-pick flex with payouts of $1 million if they're all correct, $80,000 if you get five of the six correct, and $16,000 if you get four out of six correct. Full details can be found at pricepicks.com slash million. You must opt in at that link to be eligible for the million-dollar entry. Once you opt in, all you have to do is play the game like normal, and you could be the lucky winner. Prize picks is daily fantasy done right. Plain and simple. There's no complicated salary cap, no complicated scoring. It's just you versus the projections. If they believe that Jason Tatum is going to score 30 points, if you believe he'll score more than 30 points, and that's the projection, you just simply say he's going to score more than 30 points. And you pull those, pull some picks together to make your prize picks entry. You're not playing up against the Sharks. You're not playing up against the other people. It's just you versus the numbers. It's truly a test of your skill. If you get all your picks correct, you can win up to 25 times your money in addition to if you get picked for the Superflex promotion. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus projections available. And PrizePix offers projections on any sport you watch, including NBA, MLB, NHL, PGA, and so much more. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's really that easy. They offer safe and fast withdrawals. They're currently operational in more than 30 states and Canada. Download the PrizePix app today or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match of up to $100 with promo code Locked On. If you deposit $100, Price Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Price Picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code Locked On to sign at sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100. Okay, it's time to talk about the Arkansas duo. Um, I'm going to pair them up because a lot of their problems are kind of similar. Um, Anthony Black is probably, outside of Victor Wembanyama, probably the best defender in this draft class. Um, Every time I see him play, you can see the defensive energy, and he's got good size for a guard, and, and he really, really gets after it. Um, Anthony Black averaged 12.8 points per game, 5.1 rebounds per game, 3.9 assists per game, shooting splits of 45-331, 70.5. There you can already see the concern and why he's such a good defender, but why he's down here and uh, why he's potentially down here. I've seen Bach drafts have him 8, 9, 10. So, it, you know, again, who knows where he's actually going to land. This guy can get after you defensively. He can be, be a little bit of an athlete getting to the basket, but... His shot is what's going to determine whether he makes it in the league. Now, just plain and simple. Again, the simple answer is usually the right one. If Anthony Black can figure out how to shoot, if he can develop a shooting, this is a top 10 pick. This is a really good player, a really strong contributor. If he can't figure out how to shoot, he, he ain't Marcus Smart good. Um, and so that's 
That's going to be the determinant for him. Nick Smith Jr. is very much in the same boat. Same boat. Nick Smith is not near, not the defender he is. He's certainly more of an athlete, certainly more of an offensive-minded player, but he really struggled. Um, he had a major knee injury that kept him out for nearly two months, averaging 12.4, 12, 12, 12.4 points per game after coming back from the injury, 37.2 Field goal percentage, 35.3% from beyond the arc, 67.7% from the foul line. He's got some of that explosiveness. You could see some of it throughout the course of the season. He could finish at the rim. He could finish at the basket. But at the end of the day, it's still about a shot. And clearly, he was hurt. Again, the context matters. He was clearly injured. He was clearly not healthy for a good chunk of the season. And so, there was just a major question mark. And, And I think when you look at him... And the thing that he's going to have to answer through workouts, and, and look, these guys should be competing against everyone they can. Like Anthony Anthony Black is a competitor. If I'm him, if I'm his agent, I'm saying, get me in a room with everyone I can get in. My guy's going to outwork them. That's what they should be doing because he's got a lot to prove. Nick Smith needs to do the same thing because he's got to prove that his knee is healthy and he's got to prove that what we saw during the college season, what we saw on tape at the collegiate level, that was an injured Nick Smith Jr. If Nick Smith Jr. is healthy, he is really good. That is, you know, high lottery uh, talent. But again, there's just this huge question mark hanging over. And, and again, it's about what risk are you willing to take? What are you seeing? What changes that's going to help? That's going to help you kind of grow, kind of get there. A couple other prospects to talk about that could go at 11. Uh, I want to highlight Noah Clowney of Alabama. While Brandon Miller was doing a lot of the work on the on the, on the the perimeter, Noah Clowney was doing the dirty work on the inside. He projects as a power forward at the NBA level. Um, just a really, really solid player uh, in, in, a lot, in a lot of ways. 9.8 points per game, 7.9 rebounds per game. Rebound rate at 15.5%, 21.4% defensive rebound rate. So he's pretty active on the glass. Um, not much of an offensive player, though. Can maybe step out and hit 12, 15-foot jumpers. Not going to shoot threes at this point. He was the guy doing the dirty work, though. And so, if you're looking for guys that are going to do the dirty work in, in this draft, Noah Clowney certainly one that everyone's really excited about. Really young player. Got good length, good size. Everyone thinks he can play play up or, to, up or down a couple positions um, defensively. The other guy to look out for is Gigi Jackson. Gigi Jackson is one of the youngest players in this draft. Went to South Carolina. Pure energy guy at this point. Doesn't know what he's doing offensively. Um, you know, just just all all energy is the best way. He's a bigger bow outlaw um, is how I would describe his play at this point. Um, but certainly the room to develop into more. I mean, it's just just it's just not all there yet. There's a lot of raw materials, but it's not all there yet. If you could tell, you know, Kobe Bufkin is another guy to keep an eye on from Michigan. Uh, Michigan, um, but if you can tell. I'm not super enamored with this draft class. Um, we hit 12, 13, 14, 15. If you're outside of the lottery, uh, you know, I could see you falling in love with Jet Howard. I could see you falling in love with Bilal Kulabali. This ain't it. This ain't the draft class. Uh, I've seen some people, you know, I in our mock draft, I had a couple people trying to trade up to my picks, trying to get me to move down. And I was just like, you know, honestly, after the lottery, I am not into this draft class at all. Um, they're just, they're, you know, at least my guys that I have in the lottery, there's just not a lot for me to go. You know, I think there's very little separating, you know, maybe pick 13 to pick 20. Like that's how big that group is. And, and again, you can, you could tell, like, I have big questions for a lot of guys, even the guys at the magic would draft at 11, like Hawkins to me is a sure thing compared to a lot of the other players in this draft class. And so it's. If things don't shake out the way the Magic want, they they do have some value, I think, at 11 to trade out of the draft. But you can tell there are a lot of question marks. And again, I promise that I want to focus on what guys can do. But the big but the question marks are question marks. We have to acknowledge that they exist. And look, I'm not against taking a guy like Anthony Black. I think he's super talented. I'm not against taking a guy like Nick Smith. He is super talented when he's healthy. But the question marks have to be acknowledged and it's there's a lot of them. Every single one of these players has one, and so you know going back to the start, like to me, Jordan Hawkins is the safe pick. I know he's going to be a shooter, 
Yeah, the defense, yeah, the driving, yeah, some of the other offensive skills need to fill in, but the kid's going to be able to shoot. Um, and to me, that feeling of security, that that matters. And, 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 and so at 11, I am super focused on Jordan Hawkins because I don't trust anyone else uh, in this draft class. You know, again, I, I'm sure you can find a lockdown podcast that'll say, oh, I like this guy. I really like this guy. I hope he's there, there at 12, 13, 14. I'm not sure he will be. And I'm sitting here saying, like, I don't know about this guy. Some of it's team context. Shooting's really important for the Magic. It's plain and simple. Shooting really matters. But there's a lot more to, to sort through. There's a lot more to, to figure out. Um, and, and obviously, we got time to really dive deeper into these guys. And, and we're going to do that. Today was just an introduction to some of these players. We'll do a lot more in the coming weeks. But that's going to do it for me today. I want to thank you all again for listening to today's episode of Locked on Magic. Of course, find me on Twitter at philiprr underscore md. Subscribe to the podcast and Apple Podcasts. Search your tune in Himalaya, Google, Spotify, Odyssey, and all the information on the podcast to your podcast enabled listening device. For latest on the Orlando Magic, be sure to follow, be sure to check out orlandomagicdaily.com. Follow me on Twitter there at omagicdaily. We want to thank you again for making Locked on Magic part of your day every day for my everydayers. Tomorrow we're going to get back to player evaluations. We're going to talk about Markel Fultz and the season that he had. Plus, what Aaron Gordon's trip to the NBA Finals says about the Magic, says about him, says about the de- revisit the deal with the Nuggets a little bit. We'll talk about that on tomorrow's episode of Locked on Magic. But until then, for Orlando Magic Daily and Locked on Magic, this has been Phil Frost from Mike. We'll see you all again next time for another episode of Locked on Magic.